Good morning, everybody. Today is April 29th, uh, 2021. Uh, my name is Adam Evangelista, and I'll be your host here for today for another installment of Kativ's Virtual Academy, um, Autodesk Virtual Academy here. Uh, today we have quite a collection of hosts and guests here to help bring us through into the new year for Inventor 2022. Um, first and foremost, we have the gregarious Garen Gardner, along with a, a few other choice people from Autodesk here as well. well. Let me turn on my camera, my apologies. Uh, I'll let them introduce themselves shortly. We also have another guest for a Kativ veteran, Javier Chavez here as well. Uh, Javier, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself here and then we'll go over to Gar uh, Garen? So uh, Javier Chavez here from uh, Kativ Technologies, uh, veteran. Um, uh, application engineer. So you guys have seen me, uh, I'm sure on a couple other AVAs, but uh, I, I've been here a good pl uh, 16 plus years. So um, if you look back in some of the other uh, older AVAs, you'll see, see me there. Uh, but my role's a little bit different. So I'm a technical solution specialist and uh, I typically you know, work with uh, some of the sales guys to try to match you guys up with the right technologies and the right uh, uh, services. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Javier is a fantastic resource for us here today to help supplement this conversation. Um, and of course, we have Garen as well. Garen, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, if I can get myself off mute. Uh, Garen Gardner. Uh, I'm a, a product manager at Autodesk. Been uh, actually just looked at LinkedIn the other day and saw it's been 18 years. I, I thought I'd been at 16 years, but uh, time flies, I guess, when you're having fun. Uh, focused primarily on Inventor most of my career, a little bit on Fusion. And um, yeah, super excited. Uh, we appreciate the, the invite to be able to come and share what's new in 2022 and you know talk about what we've been working on for the last couple of years. Yeah, fantastic. Glad to have you back. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, we also have a few other people from Autodesk here as well. We have Andrew Fax, Fakes, um, and also Stephen Dennis. Would you guys like to introduce yourself as well, please? Uh, fakes, you were right the second time. Right on, thank you. Yeah, yeah so I'm, I'm a user experience designer. I've been on the Inventor team since uh, 2003. Happy to be here, thank you. Hi, I'm Steve Dennis. I've been a developer working on Inventor since before R1, like 23 year anniversary was two days ago. Oh, I've, I worked on one of the things you're gonna hear about here is model states. I did that for the last two years. And now I'm back working on what we call the jet, the just do it, the JDI projects. I see, I see. Well, happy anniversary. Good to have you, Stephen. I, you mentioned model states, and I, I know uh, there's a whole suite, or should I say, collection of new features and uh, pro uh, <laughs> workflows inside of Inventor 2022. Heard about model states. I heard a lot of new interoperability. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to you, Garen, but do you want to tell us a little bit more about what's in store for us in Inventor 2022? Yeah, I'll say Steve has touched about every line of code in the product, I think. So uh, <laughs> yeah. um, we, we may also be joined by Johnson Shui and, uh, and Chris Mitchell. I, I think if you've spent some time in our discussion forums, betas, you've probably interacted with some or, or all, of, all of these folks, um, you know, super knowledgeable in the product. One of the things we wanted to do as we provide an, an update to what's new is allow you to, to put your questions in the chat and, and we'll answer them as we can. So, um, you know, we'd like to do a QA and a at the end if we have time as well, but, you know, certainly make sure that, uh, that you use the chat, ask questions. You have some really good resources here to, to see, get, get more info on what's new and, and whatever else. Correct. And if I could interject there, this is a traditional Zoom webinar. So there is a Q&A section where you can submit questions over there, which we'll uh, you know, go through, of course, and have some time at the end slotted for. There's also a chat dialogue box available if you guys want to reach out through us through there. Q&A is preferred, but you know, whatever works. And at the end, there's also going to be a survey for any other feedback. To, so expect that email at the end of this as well. Okay. Back to you, Garen. Great. So, you know, this is a fun time of year for us. We've been working on, you know, a number of these things like model state, you know, we've been working on that for a couple of years and a lot of these other things for a while. And it's exciting for us to, for launch, to be able to talk about it, like for you guys to get your hands on it and play with it. So a lot of fun for us. Um, you know, if, if we look at, I like to highlight the team that's behind this. You know, a lot of these folks you don't really see or hear anything about, but these are the folks that are really doing this. You know, uh, somebody did some quick math and some, something like 2000 years of experience on the, on the inventor team, um, you know, focusing on a lot of what, you, what you'll see today. So, you know, it's pretty exciting and, and we, we love for you guys to see our work and to get feedback. You know, I think as uh, I think Steve and Andrew can attest, 
it's changed a lot how we gather feedback from you guys and, and how early and often we, we like to get that feedback and actually get that into the product. And, you know, a lot of these folks are part of, you know, they're watching the discussion boards, participating in, in forums and seeing what's going on and, and leveraging that feedback. Um, and believe it or not, we have over a million users that are using Inventor and, and Vault. Uh, you know, on a, a pretty regular basis. And with that, there's billions of files that's being created and managed with, uh, with these tools. So one, you know, we're honored to be able to work on that and get feedback and, and drive that forward with you guys. And, you know, it's also one of those things that we don't take lightly. We know that uh, you guys rely on, on a lot of what we do for your, your daily job. And, you know, over the, the last year, things have changed a lot. I'll talk a little bit about the, the development process of how we gather feedback and what goes into the product. But, you know, that's changed a lot this year as, as you know, we look at a lot of our offices, this is kind of what they look like. We're working remotely, we're, we're doing a lot of Zoom calls. I'm sure when the pandemic hit, you, you know, it was a struggle to get software on your machines, work remotely from home. And, you know, consequently, we're actually getting different feedback now for the product than we did maybe a year ago in, in some regards and making it easier to be able to work remotely. Um, and, and as we talk about those billions of files that are being accessed, you know, how can those easily be accessed, collaborated and work from, you know, about anywhere. And, you know, this probably doesn't look too unfamiliar to many of you that, you know, we often are taking calls with kids sitting next to us working, working on math or, you know, in all sorts of different places on different devices. And, uh, you know, again, that's kind of feeding into some of the feedback that we're receiving with, with the product. Um, but I wanted to talk, you know, at like September, around September every year, we put a survey out to get an idea of, you know, what's on your mind? What, what are the things that are really important to you? And this is, this was from a couple of years ago that fed into this release, uh, you know, things like, um, well, basically stack rank, what are the highest, most important things for you guys? And performance often comes top of mind, uh, things in the idea station. It was all alternate representations now known as model states. But you, you can see a lot of the things that have been really important over the years. And, you know, we've worked on a lot of these things year over year, things like performance. I mean, realistically, we've worked on performance every release that I've been involved in. Um, that's just something that we're always working on. Um, modernization, you know, we've done a lot of work around uh, the, the, the dialog box or now, now known as the property panel, dark theme and, you know, those kinds of things just to, to freshen up the product and make it more productive and easier to use. And, um, this last year, some of the feedback that we got in September, as I mentioned, things have, have changed a little bit, the kind of feedback we're getting. You know, automation and performance have always been number one. Uh, the thing that kind of surprised us here is model-based enterprise. You know, this is something that we added into the product um, several years ago, and we've seen a slow churn of people starting to use it more and more. Um, but I, I think now with working remotely, now collaborating um, more and, and not being in the same office all the time, we're seeing more and more requests for things like model-based enterprise, where you have a single model that can have dimensions, annotations on it, and that can be viewed in 3D and other, you know, people can, can view that easily and collaborate off of it. And we're, we're getting more and more requests around that. So, you know, these are some things we're hearing about. Also things like cloud data platform, industry conversions. Um, so, you know, just, I, I, you know, it's always good to see as, as we're sharing these things with you, you know, we, we get a lot of feedback. We look at this, we start building some prototypes and get more feedback from you guys. So one, make sure you're active in discussion forums. If you get any beta or any survey requests, you know, we'd love to hear from you guys to make sure that we get as wide of information as we can. And then we like to validate and get, get more feedback from you. And these are just some of the things that we're hearing about. But with that, I know that you guys mostly came to see what's new in 2022. Hopefully you guys have had a chance to install and play with it a little bit. I know, uh, you know, oftentimes this takes uh, six, eight months before you, you put it in, in action and, and utilize it for your day-to-day um, usage, but, you know, hopefully you've played around with some of the things like model state and, and where we're going with it. Um, you know, we, when we start looking at the next release of the product, you know, we kind of have three areas that we focus on. One is professional grade. I'll say this is just meat and potatoes. This is the stuff that you guys use every day. You know, this is creating drawings, models, uh, you know, simulation, assemblies, you know, this is just all the goodness that, that you typically use. And, you know, what are the things that we need to do in those areas? We also look at how can we connect you with, with more workflows, more um, 
more, more industries, more, you know, kind of converge some of these things. So one, one that we've heard a lot about over the years is Revit Inventor Interop. We actually have a pretty high percentage of customers that interact with builders and product, product manufacturers and looking to make these workflows better and easier. And, and you know, you saw that in 2021 and you'll see that more in 2022. Um, also products like Fusion, you know, as, um, as you may have, you know, yourself, you may be doing design work and using Inventor Cam for all the manufacturing in house. And that's fantastic. You know, there are some folks that do a lot of outsourcing. And when they outsource, you know, a lot of the job shops will use Fusion 360. So they want easy ways to get the inventor model into Fusion 360 for downstream workflow. So we've we've made some, some nice inroads to make it really easy to get your data over and work there. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then, you know, just looking at the overall experience. So the last few years, you've seen us enhance the kind of the user interface. We've modernized it. We added dark theme last year. Uh, you know, we added the property panel, which, you know, really kind of streamlined a lot of commands. And also it's, it's more of a, a modern architecture for us. As we introduce things like dark theme, we can basically flip the switch and say dialogues are dark or dialogues are, are light, and we don't have to go to every single one to update. So, you know, there are things like that, that from an architectural standpoint are great for us. And from uh, just using the product, we did a lot of work with eye tracking and understanding how you um, utilize the command to see how we needed to organize and structure that to make you faster. And I, I think as you guys have used extrude and, and a lot of those commands that are in the property panel, you probably found that, you know, it, we moved the cheese a little bit, it takes a, a few days to kind of relearn where things are. But once you do, we found people are, are faster through it and it's easier to learn for new users. So, you know, that's when we look at the overall inventor experience. Those are some of the things that we think about. So let's get into, uh, you know, some of the, I'll call it just do it. Steve mentioned this a little bit earlier, but, you know, when some of the things that folks like the most are, are you know, just those little things that kind of drive you crazy that, you know, you see day in and day out when you're using the product. And we like to, we like to, to enhance those. We look a lot in the discussion forums and look at what those things are, what gets voted up and introduce those. In fact, we had 30, 30 new ideas that were implemented this, this release five of which came from beta. And, you know, that was, uh, there was like a total of 2,400 ideas that, um, that we, um, that, that, that was impacted in a positive way by the, these changes. So, you know, again, just really looking at what you guys are asking for. But some of these things are, are things like text formatting, just making it easier to use a dialog box, you know, better flow, reduce the clutter. You know, some of it's like in drawings when you're placing a dimension, that we automatically break out center marks and center lines. You know, just overall goodness just makes things nice and clean. Um, you know, some of which is being able to just copy some uh, copy faces and paste them somewhere else in the same window. Uh, you know, we couldn't use a, a window, um, just a window select to be able to, to do that in the past. Uh, you know, and some of it is just up how we update um, substitutes if you use substitutes a fair amount. So these are all little things. Are they a huge? No, but, you know, kind of bringing them together, it just makes a better experience as you're using the product. Um, you know, things like when you're editing a feature, we now put leader lines on the, the, the geometry so that you can see what you're editing. Uh, being able to copy a sheet within the same drawing file. Uh, and also, you know, we're, we're looking at things like QIF. I don't know how many of you are familiar with QIF, but, you know, if you're looking for inspection information, uh, QIF is, a, is becoming a, a de facto standard. And we introduced the export of QIF into in, uh, Inventor. So, you know, things like that, that again, uh, hopefully overall day-to-day -day makes your job easier as you're doing design work, collaborating, working with, with other groups and other products, um, just making that easier for you. Um, and then, you know, things like constraint status. So years ago in, in the sketcher, we added the ability to see what was fully locked down and what wasn't. So you could turn on the, the degree of freedom for your sketches and see fully, fully constrained or not. Um, we, one of the idea stations that was submitted that we did this year was much the same thing for components. So if you're in an assembly and you want to see what's fully locked down today, well, prior to 2022, you had to grab a component, kind of wiggle it a little bit. And if it moved, it wasn't fully constrained. If it didn't move, it was. And if it moved, you have to undo it and get it back to its original state. Well, now you have an option that you can come in and say, hey, turn on, um, show, show this, this state in my, um, 
in my dialog box or in my browser. And you can see over here that it shows dots for things that are fully constrained, uh, you know, hollow dots that are under constrained. And then, you know, if there's an unknown status where it needs to update, you can see a dash. So it's pretty easy to see what's constrained, what's not constrained. Um, and, and just, again, overall goodness in helping you as you're doing your design work and, and assembling your components. Uh, you know, we talk about the property panel. This was introduced, I think, three years ago with measure command. And then we, we updated it with extrude. Extrude was the first command that we introduced in the property panel that was kind of a main command. And, you know, we didn't take that lightly. There was a lot of work. In fact, I, I don't know if I've seen us do anywhere near this amount of work on other commands initially with our user experience. We did things like eye tracking. We had a lot of customers come in and see how they used the, the product and kept track of how they, you know, what they did, where they got hung up, got new users that hadn't used Inventor and how, how would they try to use it and develop the property panel. And it's much more of a top down, you know, the things that you need to do uh, at first kind of down the list and it flows much, much easier and, and much nicer. Um, so there's a lot of work just in the experience in the property panel. And then there are things that like docking it, you know, you can dock it in the browser, you can drop it, drop it on the right, dock it on the right side of the screen. Um, so it was just far more friendly in, in utilizing that and, and a bit more modern. So, so now, you know, there are other commands like fillet that we've wanted to, to integrate that with. And this year we integrated the property panel with fillet. Um, and, you know, the fillet command initially had all three types of fillets built into the same dialog box. So when you launched fillet, you could do a, a face fillet, a full round and an edge fillet. What we found is, you know, most customers use edge fillet, very high, high percentage of customers use edge fillet and, you know, much less face, face and full round. Um, they're still useful commands, but you don't use them all the time. We found that that uh, kind of cluttered the user experience quite a bit. And also it's kind of nice to see in the browser if a fillet is a full round and edge or a face fillet. So we broke those out into three separate commands. They, they all three have their own, um, their own shortcut keys. So you can still launch them quickly, but it just made it, uh, made a, us able to clean it up a bit and make it easier to use. And then we also added things like a selection mode. You know, you could do a shift right click and, and, and change the selection mode, but we put it just on the side of the dialog box or the, the property panel. So now you could easily filter out what type of geometry you're grabbing. So, you know, it made it much easier to get the geometry, see what the geometry is and, and add the inputs. So overall, I think you'll find it's a, a cleaner, easier interface. And, you know, if, if it allows you to, to just pick the fillet type that you really want. And then, you know, I mentioned uh, performance. You know, we are always looking at ways that we can enhance performance. And this year, one of the, the big focuses was uh, allowing the GPU to manage um, a bit more to give you more performance. And so what happens, you know, if you're in assembly and you double click on a part or a subassembly, everything ghosts out. Well, it, it takes some time for the computer to ghost everything out and display that. Um, so this year we, we, uh, we basically turn that over to the GPU to be able to support that. And it's much faster. You'll notice that when you're editing things, it's much, much quicker. And it's really on the graphics side but there are a lot of areas that we relied on that. So you'll, you'll notice, and I'll show you a video here in a second, um, much easier just entering and exiting uh, things like parts and assemblies. Also, if you ever use wireframe, you'll notice in a big assembly, wireframes are much slower than, than a, a shaded view. Um, and, and that's just how the, the graphics is, is, um, is, is utilized. Now with the GPU, you'll notice that it's much, much faster if you're using anything with edges, wireframes, things like that. So we'll take a, a quick, we'll, we'll watch a video from Luke that highlights some of these things. Increasing product performance and improving your productivity each release is a critical part of product development. Performance has been increased in Inventor 2022 for multiple in-place editing workflows. Just about everything you create in Inventor starts with a sketch. The in-place creation and editing of sketches within the context of an assembly now executes faster. You'll also see speed improvements for the in-place creation of work features. You'll notice that when object visibility is off, only newly created sketches and work features show during feature creation. When editing in place, you'll notice that editing eye properties is now possible for all components in the assembly, 
not just the components you're working on. What you see on the screen has also improved performance, specifically with view orientation, panning, and zooming. Visual styles with edge silhouettes are now rendered using the GPU, providing better performance for shaded with edges, hidden line, and wireframe visual styles. You don't want to wait while your files open and close or when you're dragging partially constrained components around on the screen. You'll see improved performance for both of these in this release. Aside from manually moving components around on your screen, you'll also notice improved graphic consistency and performance when animating relationships using the drive command. Understanding what is fully constrained and under constrained in your assembly isn't always obvious. Inventor 2022 now has constraint status indicators in the browser. You can now use the browser filter to hide fully constrained components in the browser to help you visualize which components have remaining degrees of freedom. All cool. right. Yeah, and I've got a couple of videos. Um, there's a couple of them that are a little bit longer, but um, for model state and Revit interoperability that I think has a lot of great details that um, I think you guys will appreciate. Um, so we'll get to those in a minute. Uh, but yeah, so there, there's a lot of goodness in there. A lot of that is feedback that we've received from you over the last couple of years. An another one is instance properties. And um, this is one, if, if you've needed it, you're probably really excited about this. It actually was voted pretty high in our discussion, in, uh, in our, our system. But um, instance properties allows you to have a part or an assembly and have a unique identifier in each of those instances. So I may have a top level assembly and have something like an electric motor um, or, or a connector or something that may be referenced in there multiple times. So it's the same part or assembly that's just instanced in there. Um, but on each one of those, I want to have a, a unique tag or a unique identifier. In the past, you couldn't really do it. You'd have to do a design copy if you really wanted to do it. So you'd have multiple copies of that part or assembly, which is not ideal because if you need to change one somewhere, you have to make the change everywhere. And it's just a headache, you know, for, for a data management perspective, it's just a nightmare. So here now you can put unique identifiers in on each of those components that can be represented in the in your bill of material. Uh, on your drawing in, in notes and, uh, and you can see that pretty much anywhere. So makes it much easier. You can just tag those, add whatever identifier you want and move on. You don't have to do a unique copy of your components. So kind of subtle, but it's something that is, uh, you know, a really nice time saver. Um, another one when we get into drawings. So in the past, if you created a drawing with a shaded view, you couldn't change the light style of the shaded view. It just had the default light style and you couldn't make any adjustments. So if you didn't like the light style or you wanted to be more consistent with the 3D model, you couldn't really do it. Um, now you can actually change that, um, that shaded view in the drawing to give you the, the same representation as your model if you want. Um, at last year, we did some work in drawings on the automation side. So we had our, our templates where you could automatically uh, create drawing views off of models and have it you know, kind of lay things out and get you pretty far along. Um, we added the ability now to include 3D annotations with that. So if you've generated, you know, if, if you remember up front, we talked about MBD, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing more and more customers that are looking to leverage that. And this is one of those areas that it's beneficial. If you have MBD baked into your part or assembly, now when you create drawings, you can say, you know, automatically include the 3D annotations for the view and it'll do that. So, you know, you can start automating your drawings, you, you know, much farther than, than you could in the past. So that's a, a real nice enhancement on the drawing side. And then I've got about a 10 minute video here on model states. And um, you know, I always like to do these things live if we can, it just wasn't in the cards today, but um, model states is, uh, so if, if any of you have used things like iParts and iAssemblies to generate configurations, model states is similar. The, the idea behind it though, is really to capture the, the manufacturing states of a model and be able to represent that in, in drawings and downstream documentation. So you can see here, I have a part uh, in this case and uh, you know, I may have it as a cast part and then I wanna show machining off or facing off one of the, the faces, putting some holes in here, uh, maybe putting some edges and fillets and being able to capture that all as a model state. So I could create drawings with views of each of those model states. Um, and then, you know, similar to iParts and iAssemblies, you can also capture it in configuration. So you can say, you know, I want to drive this with Excel or I want to have five configurations that can change, you know, diameter, length, width, all those things. 
And the, the unique thing with it too is all the all of the information is stored in that part or assembly. So like with with iParts and iAssemblies, when you use a configuration, it creates a, a new file on disk of that configuration. This actually stores it all at the, the part or assembly level. Um, so depending on what you're doing, it may be really beneficial for you, or you may want to continue to use parts and assemblies. Now, this does replace LOD reps. So if you've used LOD reps, they will get migrated to, to model states. And this is a really great way. You'll see on the, the Revit side, this is a great way when we do simplifications to be able to catch, uh, to capture various level of details that you can represent um, for manufacturability, for collaboration, whatever the case may be. So with that, I'm going to start this. Uh, let me know if you don't hear the video, but this this goes in this goes in quite a bit of detail. So you know, I think this will be very informational for you and uh, be able to get a good idea of, of what uh, what model states are. Righty, let's talk about model states. Uh, so first of all, model states work at both the part level and at the assembly level. And what I'd like to demonstrate for you here uh, today is how to create model states at both the part and assembly level. I want to walk you through a couple of examples first, uh, and then I want to show you actually how to create the model states themselves. So first of all, uh, model states are similar to I parts and I assemblies. A lot of you will say, well, isn't that just what this is? And the biggest difference is, let's say this example here, I'm showing the manufacturing stages of this component. All of this information, whenever I switch from cast to machine to drilled to finish to CNC, if you look at the browser, you'll notice that features are being suppressed and they're being saved in that individual model state rather than in multiple files. So the biggest difference between model states and I parts and I assemblies is you don't have the additional overhead of individual files for each model state. So in this example, we're showing how this part could go through the manufacturing stage. So we can go all the way from our cast component and we can document that all the way through our finished component. And when we create our drawings, we just call up whatever model state we want and we can do all of that actually inside of the same drawing with one single part file. At the assembly level, it's really similar. So in this example, we have this lifter assembly and you can see that I have zero through four units. And if you look at the browser, you can see that at the assembly level, not only can we suppress features, but in the assemblies, it actually suppresses components. So keep in mind when you're using model states because we are suppressing components, this does affect Bill of materials and parts lists and those sorts of things. So just keep that in mind. You may want to just shut the visibility of something off rather than suppressing it. But we can easily go from a zero unit to a two unit to a three unit and to a four unit. And if you look in the browser, you can see what's happening. It's digging into these sub assemblies and into these individual components. So if I open this file, you can see that there's multiple model states and what I'm telling inventor is which one to call. So a really easy way to take your model states at the part level and bring that up into your assemblies and I'll show you how to do that uh, in a little bit. So let's start out with creating model states and there's actually a couple of different ways to do it. So right here, I have uh, an impeller. It has 10 blades. Uh, I have a couple other things going on here. Uh, I have a parameter that controls the number of blades. That's probably the most important thing. And then I also have, if I go over to my annotate tab, my general note, you can see that I'm calling out part number and stock number automatically from my eye properties. So I'm gonna show you the manual way first, and then we're gonna do this automatically. So let's say I wanna go from 10 to 20. Uh, I'll take this 10, I will copy it, I'll activate that next model state, and what I'm going to do is that's going to be 11, and now what I have to do is I have to go to my I properties, my project, and now I'm going to incrementally change these all to be the next version in the series, and then most importantly again, I'll go to my parameters, and I'll change that to 11. So if I had to do that from 10 to 20, that's going to take a little while. But what we can do with model states at both the part level and the assembly level is we can actually leverage 
Excel. So inside of Excel, we are gonna do what Excel does really well. We are gonna increment. So I'm gonna take this bottom row here and I'm just going to have Excel automatically take me from 11 to 20 and you can see it automatically updates the member, the part number, description, stock number, and most importantly, the number of blades for that parameter blade underscore number. Close the file, make sure that you save it. And literally in a matter of seconds, I now have every variety of this impeller inside of a single part file. And the interesting thing here is we can take this a step further. So not only am I controlling the general note, I'm controlling the parameter, I could change material, color, you name it, but I can also suppress features. So I'm just gonna go over to my 3D model tab and with 20 active, so let's say 20, 15, and 12 don't have this center hub. I'm gonna do just a direct edit on that face. I'm gonna move that down and I'm gonna take that up to that face right there. And now on 20, that is, I have a direct edit getting rid of that hub. When I go to 19, the hub is still there and I could go to 15 and 12, but if I go back to my Excel spreadsheet, I now have a brand new column called direct edit five. So this is that direct edit I created and it's only being computed on the 20. So I will copy this and put it on 15 and I will also put that on 12. Make sure you close and save. And now if I go to 15, I have no hub. 12, I have no hub, but all my other variations have that hub. So again, a really quick way to create variations, to create tables inside of Excel. And again, we can add in computing features, we can add features, we can delete features, we can use direct edit, uh, you name it. So really, really great way. And again, going back to the original real benefit here is this is all in a single part file. So the next example uh, is Let's say I wanna create a uh, simplified version of this component here. So you can see I started this a little bit. So I have a fine and a medium, but let's say I want a really coarse level of this. Perhaps I have some AEC counterparts that I wanna share this with. Uh, and this in turn goes into an assembly that also has a fine and a medium. And again, I don't wanna to have to create multiple files. So what I can do is I'll start inside of my part file and I'm gonna copy my medium. I'm gonna activate it. And this one is gonna be called course. And once I have renamed that, I'm now gonna use my simplification tools and I'm just gonna create a bounding box. If you don't see your simplification tools, you can just hit this down arrow and turn on your simplification tools. So I'm gonna do an envelope and I'm gonna do a rectangle on this bottom face. I'm gonna resize it. I'm gonna drag up and I'm gonna use my snap to that top face right there. I'm gonna do another one. I'm gonna switch this to a bounding cylinder. I'm gonna resize it. I'm gonna snap to that face right there. So again, a super coarse variety of this particular component. So again, my fine, my medium, maybe I use this one for simulation purposes, but this one is my share with my AEC or my Revit counterpart. Now at the assembly level, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that medium and I'm gonna do a very similar process. I'm going to copy it, activate it. I'm gonna rename it. And now what I need to do is there's a tool called link model states underneath productivity. So with course active, I'm going to tell this which model states to activate based off of that name. So I should have, if I spelled it correctly, a course model state at the part level for all of these components that I can activate. And it's going to show all of those components in a course state. So I can go to fine, I can go to medium, 
and I can go to course. And I'm going to get an error message, and this is because inside of this assembly there's some mates and constraints and those sorts of things uh, that I still need to suppress. So I'll accept this, and I will go into my relationships, and there they are. So I'll just grab these. And again, because I'm only modifying this particular model state, I can actually take those and suppress them, and it's not going to affect my medium or my fine whenever I create that. So again, a really great way both at the part level and at the assembly level, first of all, to create variations, secondly, to simplify your geometry for sharing or maybe perhaps protecting your intellectual property, perhaps you need to simplify for simulation purposes. And the really great thing about a lot of these tools is we would do a lot of this stuff retrospectively after we completed our designs. But you can see in this example, if I create all of these model states beforehand, I can very easily leverage them in my assemblies and sub-assemblies down the road. So I hope you see that there's some really great value here with checking out model states. In All right, uh, hopefully you found that beneficial. And I know it's a little bit longer video, but um, Luke and Paul on our tech marketing side do a fantastic job uh, explaining kind of what's going on with these. And I think model state is new enough. It's really good to understand what's going on with it, how to set it up, what you can do with it. And hopefully you saw some really great places, uh, things you can do. Let's see, if, let's see if I can advance that. All right, um, on to, so we introduced dark themes last year. And, you know, dark themes was one of those things that people either loved it or could care less about it. And it was kind of an even split. But, um, you know, we had a lot of folks that were asking for a dark theme that work in low light or um, just has some sensitivity to the brightness that we had. And um, so we put dark theme in there as a preview. You know, it was one of those things that we got a lot of feedback from customers and we put it in uh, maybe a little faster than, than we'd hoped we would have to, um, but we wanted to be able to do it, get it in there and we, we put it in as a preview. So uh, we were able to get a lot of feedback over this last year. You know, changing something like a theme here, if you think about all the highlights, if you edit a part, if you select a part, um, things like work geometry, sketch geometry, dimensions. There's a lot of things to think about, and it's really easy to miss a few areas. So we, we put it in preview, got a lot of feedback this last year, and then uh, made some adjustments and pulled it out of preview. So it's fully baked into Inventor. Um, you know, we've, uh, we've made some nice adjustments. I personally like dark theme. I think it looks really nice, but again, it's personal preference. You'll find that it's now in, um, so, you know, as you, as you utilize some commands, the ones with property panel dialog boxes are darker, things like I copy, uh, things like that. You, you will still run into some dialog boxes that are still lighter, much like AutoCAD. Um, There's so many dialog boxes in the product, we'll never get a chance to update all of them. But as we modernize, as we move things to property panel, those all get the treatment of being able to automatically switch between light and dark and all the, the icons and everything update. So I think that's a, a nice one to highlight. Um, I, I mentioned when we talk about connected, I mentioned inventor fusion interoperability. And, um, you know, this is one of those that, you know, in, in your organization, if you're using inventor and inventor cam together, um, you know, it's a great workflow. Everything's tied together. You can you do everything in, in inventor. Um, there are workflows and there are, there are organizations that uh, use Fusion 360 and other products and, and want to be able to collaborate and utilize this data elsewhere. So one of the things we wanted to do is make it really easy to get inventor data into Fusion for downstream workflows. And CAM is a really big one. You know, I mentioned there's a lot of job shops that use Fusion 360 and making it really easy to take a, an inventor design, send it to Fusion and, and uh, connect that with a, a project that somebody has access to so they can do downstream work on it is really key. So we, we made it a, a single push button experience as we possibly could. And I have a, a little video I put together of just a really simple little part here. And basically what, what we can do here with this, with this part, if you go into the environment tab, there's a Send a Fusion 360. And um, the, the first time you launch this, if you're not logged in, it'll, uh, it'll walk you through logging into your Fusion team site. And then here it pulls up the different teams that you're part of and a project where you want to save it. And then I can say save to Fusion 360. And, and it's that simple. I basically just said save it. This is where I want to save it. When I go over to Fusion 360, I can now see that inventor file in my Fusion 360. 
I can open it up, uh, that inventor file, and it basically converts it. And it's almost like a derive. It opens that inventor file up, um, converts it, and, and they're linked together. So if the inventor file changes, I can update it, and then I can pull an update in Fusion 360, and we'll see that in just a second. Um, so here we've, we've opened it, we go back to inventor, we grab an edge, uh, maybe we fill it this, save it. Now it's not fully associative that it's not updated now, it's more of a push. So when, if I wanna make some additional changes when I'm ready, then I can go back and say, send this to Fusion. It detects there that it's already been uploaded. So it asks, do you wanna just upload a new version to the one that you have up there? Yes, or I can say, no, I wanna save it as a totally different file. So here you can see I have a notification that it's been updated. I can see the inventor file has two versions now. And then the Fusion file that I'm working on, I can just do an update, much like if you had a drive component and it updates that particular design. So, you know, this makes it really easy if you are working in an environment where you're collaborating with a job shop, you could push the file up there, allow them, you know, add them to the project. They can see the file. They can generate their tool path and their setup off of it. If you need to make a design change, you can make the design change, push it back up there. They can just update the work, the, the file that they've been working on, re-update their tool path. So they keep the tool path there. They don't lose any of that. It's still associated to that file. They can just regenerate the tool paths and away they go. So, you know, it's it's the fastest, easiest way we have to get inventor data over to Fusion for things like generative simulation, CAM. Um, Super easy. So if, if you are using, if, if groups of, of um, within your organization are using Fusion, this is a really great way to, to be able to collaborate with them. And again, you may not need to. You may be doing everything you need inside of Inventor, and that's great. You know, it's just options in, uh, in how you can work with it. All right, um, rounding, rounding up, uh, I have a quick little demo on the Revit side. So last year we introduced Revit Inventor Interoperability where you could bring in a Revit, a native RVT file directly inside of Inventor and utilize that to, to design something in place. So it may be that you need a simplified version of a building and maybe just a certain area of it to build a work cell. Uh, you could bring that Revit file in, bring the components that you needed, constrain inventor geometry to the Revit geometry, build you know, around walls and columns and whatever you needed. Um, and then for this release, we wanted to make it really easy to simplify the geometry that you've made inside of Inventor and be able to push it back into Revit. So you actually have kind of a two-way workflow that you bring Revit geometry in, you use that to design something in Inventor, and then you lightweight and send that Inventor model into Revit. So if you think of like a you know, if you've maybe you haven't flown for a while with with everything going on, but if you think of an airport, you have this big building, um, but you have all the the um, luggage handling that you need to design inside of Inventor. So you could bring in just the key parts of what you need um, from Revit into Inventor, design all the conveyors, all the information that you need, um, but you don't need to push the walls and and what came from Revit. You don't want to push that back to Revit. You just want to be able to simplify the work you've done in Inventor and then push that into Revit and allow it to be updated if necessary. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So let me see if, we're, if this will run the right video. I think it is, yeah. So let's play this. We've got a, a little work cell. I don't know if it's gonna do audio, which is okay. Um, just a second to start up, uh, but we've got a building that we wanna bring just, just elements of the building in here. And we've got this complex work cell you know, we don't need all of the, the high level detail, you know, that just doesn't work so well in Revit. So um, we start out by bringing the Revit model in, we can filter out the categories that, uh, that we just need to bring in. So you may want the walls, um, certain elements of Revit, but not everything. So you bring in just the, the floor, the walls, a few things there. And then in Inventor, you've got this, uh, this work cell, you know, this is a, a box packager. And um, you know, once you've designed it in place, you really wanna be able to, to simplify it. And you know, we've had simplification tools for many years inside of Inventor. But some of the things that we've done here, we've put it in a property panel. We have presets now so that you can capture common settings that you use, like you know, removing holes, removing pockets and embosses. And you can capture all of that as, uh, as a, a saved preset. And then, you know, some things that we added new here, you can remove embosses, 
uh, we can actually capture, in the past, it was just a single blob. You know, you just get one body. Now you can specify um, top level, all components, or a single blob. You can uh, go in and, and build uh, bounding boxes, envelopes around those components. So if you want all components to have an envelope or subcomponents to have an envelope, so you have some control on how detailed that's going to be. And then in the end, you can save that as a substitute in Inventor, or you can save it as an RVT file that can be opened directly inside of Revit. Um, and, and that's exactly what they're doing here. So you can, you can get that Revit file and um, model state works great because you can actually capture different model states and export you know, the model states that you need um, to be able to come into Revit with, you know, if you want a coarse version or a, a, a refined version, you can do that. And then from within here, you can see because we can export it, not as just a blob, but we can export it with all the subcomponents. When you're doing uh, when you're doing the scheduling in Revit, you can actually pull out all the notes, uh, all the information from each of those components. Um, and then you know if there is a need to update this in Inventor, you can update it, re-export it, and um, update that exported file in Revit, and and you don't lose any of that information. So you know that's a, a pretty quick workflow in you know just a pretty quick overview how the Revit Inventor works. But you know, we, we looked at it as a two phase. Last year was to get the Revit geometry into Inventor. Now we worked a lot on the light weighting and being able to save as a, nat a native Revit file. And a lot of the work that we did this year is not just for uh, AE, the AEC space. You know, if, if you're working on something that you want to reduce the IP and you know send somebody a, a much simpler model, our simplification tools are far better than they were in the past. You know, we also found areas that didn't compute in the past and did a bit of work to, to make those more robust. So overall, you'll find that we just have a, a much better experience with um, light weighting and working with that. Um, but with that, we're, we're kind of running, running uh, low on time. I want to see if there are questions we want to open up to. And, and I think Javier had uh, or Adam had something that, uh, that they want to talk about as well. So I'll wrap up there. I, I really appreciate Kativ in allowing us to come and share this with you guys. As I mentioned, we were really excited to share this with you. It's a great release. Um, there are some really good resources here um, and, and Kativ is a fantastic resource. I, I love a lot of the, the things they do. I know that they, they help you guys a ton. We really appreciate them. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Adam and um, give you your time. Yeah, high praise, Garen, much appreciated. Thank you guys again for coming by. Um, yeah, we are at the Q&A section right now. And um, just before we get started, um, I, I do want to say a few more. There's a big point about collaboration and, and you know, working the cloud and stuff like that. And so just really quick on the topic of uh, additional services that Kativ has to offer. Uh, before we get into the Q&A specifically, let me uh, pull up that slide here. And uh, feel free to submit questions while we're going through this, guys. Hang tight. So just really quick, uh, Kativ does have a few different support packages we've been rolling out recently. And so you know, if you guys are having trouble um, collaborating or if you guys are trying to work remote a bit better, uh, if you guys have any kind of trouble with like Vault, for example, we have a lot of different services available for that. On screen right now, you see a variety of different packages we have available, kind of different tiers you could think of them as. Basic licenses, Kativ support, which includes regular product support, tracking, case management, product training for onboarding and advanced users, for example. And getting into the higher tiers, we're talking about stuff like data management, which includes all of that, plus configuration, implementation of your vault, plus administration, user management, and the like. And the next tier we have beyond that is in addition to uh, vault as a service. So talking about managed hosted services, right? Because maintaining a vault and maintaining that kind of remote server connection requires a lot of maintenance, a lot of hardware, in addition to just regular vault licenses themselves, right? So SQL server, VPN tunnel. Uh, uh, this vault server itself, we're going to be hosting that sort of stuff for you guys through Kativ specifically. Uh, we have some contact info over here if you guys want any more information about the presentation thus far or about Vault as a Service in particular. So feel free to take a look at that. Feel free to reach out to us on that. And uh, looking back, uh, I'm going to toss back to the Q&A over here. And uh, right before we get into this too, I, I do want to emphasize how big of an impact like the beta testing and the forum participation has. I do actually have a quick poll just to get an idea of what you guys have right now. If, uh, anyone is participating in the polls specifically. So are you participating in the polls? Um, 
if you guys want to fill it out, it should appear on your screen shortly just to get an idea. Uh, again, very much appreciated the participation and the feedback and the testing that we have in the Autodesk community over here. Um, so while that's running, let's see what other kind of Q and A's we have here so far. We have Austin Riemann. Can I parts slash I assemblies work in tandem with model states? When or why would you use them together? Um, I think Stephen Dennis is already typing out an answer over there. Um, but I, I've, I've, I've been curious about that too, because it, it seems to me like model states is kind of taking over a lot of the responsibility of I parts and I tables and the like. Can you guys speak to that particular topic? Yeah, so the answer is by design, they're mutually, I, I parts and I assemblies are mutually exclusive from model states. You can't put a model state in an I part, you can't put an I part in them. You can put an I part into an assembly and then have a model state that references that. But you, mm -hmm. the big thing is you cannot put a model state into an I part or an I assembly. You can't make a model state inside an I part or an I assembly. And that's nice. by design. There's gonna be some workflows where an I assembly or an I part will work better. And there'll be some workflows where a model state will work better. Is that fair, Garen? Sorry, you're on mute there, Garen. I am. Yeah, no, that sounds good. I, I would 100% agree. Right on. Yeah, as I know one of the big questions is, you know, what's going to happen to I parts and I assemblies? So if you have I parts and I, um, I assemblies already, like those are still going to be functional in 2022 in addition, correct? Yep. Awesome. And as we do um, other webinars specifically on mo model states, you know, we talked about that in the chat a little bit that uh, one's coming up. Uh, we'll start talking about like how to decide, right? Should I use an iPart? Should I use a model state, you know, um, and give you some guidance on that? Because they're both still valid. Absolutely. Yeah. So definitely a big conversation we're expecting. And so uh, Javier mentioned in the chat already, we have a, another dedicated webinar for Kativ's side coming up on uh, May um, May 13th, was it Javier? Um, so look forward to that in a couple of weeks for an, um, another That's installment right. of that. Uh, let's see a few other questions we got here. Revit to Inventor, is this, uh, is this local or can it be done from a remote source? Um, that, that one I don't think requires any particular cloud support or any kind of a collaboration tool, but you could straight up bring RVT files from Revit into Inventor as long as you have access to the file. Is that correct? That is correct. And we do, we do support BIM 360. So, you know, if, if you want to do it fully native, fully local, you can, or if you want to leverage BIM 360, you know, you can put your files up there and do it that way. Perfect. Okay. And then a bill of materials and model space, uh, model states, do those get stored in vaults and how does vault manage the uh, PLM and bomb side of inventor model states? Um, any comment on that? That's a really good question. So, yeah. um, you know, it, it, it can obviously change the part numbers, right? Uh, we saw some of that in there. And um, when it comes to vault, um, you won't necessarily see in vault, uh, like a, with a, uh, a file-based lifecycle, you won't necessarily see the differences in part numbers. Um, what you will see them in, from what I understand, is in the item environment. That will pick up the right part number for the particular model state that you're seeing. Um, and if you, if uh, any, if Steve or, you know, somebody else wants to chime in on that. I, I'm pretty sure that's the way I understand it. Yeah, the vault workflow is a little bit out of my realm, but my understanding is the same as what you just said, is that the way to deal with model states in the vault is to use the item workflows that have been used, for instance, if you put a SOLIDWORKS configuration into the vault, if you have to use the item workflow to do the same thing. Each model state has its own bomb, though. I see, I see. And then in a similar topic, um, someone had asked about instance properties and Javier typed this into the chat as well. And one interesting application of the instance properties that we were seeing was that you could use them as possibly as like location tags, like you would in maybe like a schematic panel or something similar. Um, in that same vein, is it possible to then map those instant properties that we see on the inventor side with the I properties inside of the inventor files, um, like you would any other kind of vault property that shows up? Well, there, um, Steve may have a better idea how that's implemented from a development perspective, but they do show up as custom properties really for um, a part or sub-assembly. I see, I see. I'm not, I'm not fully up to speed with how the vault is accessing the instance properties, but in the end, the instance properties are just custom high properties. Oh, interesting. Okay, that's perfect, that's perfect. Okay, I got a question about that on the YouTube side over there. Uh, 
Get nice some praise from Ravi over there. Let's see what other questions we got. Can model states allow multiple dimensions of a feature, such as a flat spring with a dimension to bend command? First instinct, I want to say probably. You could probably do that, but um, any other comments on that? I think much like uh, much like a, an I part or I assembly, you know, the the same type of things that you can adjust with parameters, dimensions, um, you, you'd be able to do in model state. So, um, without fully knowing what he's doing, if 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 um, if you can do it there, you should be able to do it in model states, and it's just captured in the same document. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah, I, I love that it's a lot more centralized like that into the same part because yeah. uh, a lot of the intentions are already kind of captured in that workflow now. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think we have time for, well, I think we're going to cut it off there. Actually, we're at the hour right here. So um, let me just start off by saying I ended off. Thank you so much, Garen and the team, for coming by here today. Um, Javier has to leave as well, but much appreciated. I hope to see you guys again soon for next year. Feel free to reach out to us with any more questions with the contact info on screen over there. Um, and we're happy to go into any other discussions beyond here. So um, with that, thanks again and have a good weekend, everybody. We'll talk soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye, all. Bye, everybody. Thank you.